um, this meeting is being recorded. Apparently, that's nice to know. Um, I was going to talk a little bit about my research, and as I also understand it, you sort of want to know a little bit about not quite the personal journey, but the motivations behind what we do and how we sort of connect that to the real world. So I'm going to try and cover some of those topics. Uh, I'll talk for about 20, 30 minutes, and then we can just uh, have a chat. Um, there's only a few of you, so I'm perfectly happy for it to be more of a discussion. Uh, but let me start by uh, going over to my slides and let me introduce you to uh, some of my work or one aspect of it. So I'm going to share my screen a second. All right. And uh, please interrupt me, Pam, if there's a problem, but I'm going to assume you can all see my screen right now. Uh, so the topic of my talk is you're using neuroscience to understand collective experience, uh, live theater and underwater nightclubs, and I will explain what the hell that means later. Uh, a lot of this work is done in collaboration with Joe Devlin, that's why his name is on here, and you're going to hear from him, I think, later this afternoon uh, sometime. He's going to talk more about his own research and how it feeds into this. Uh, but I wanted to um, start just by thinking about why I ended up here uh, doing stuff in underwater nightclubs and live theater. That's not where I started. And I think it's worth thinking about since you're young uh, students yourselves, I think there's a big misunderstanding about what research is and what PhDs are um, in the outside world. So my wife was watching a serial killer show on TV the other night. Um, she loves a serial killer, my wife. And they were talking about a guy and they wanted to say how intelligent he was. And they said, oh my God, he's so clever. He's got three PhDs. And I thought, Ooh, that's really bad. If you've got three PhDs, that means there's two fields where you couldn't get a proper job. Uh, and, but they meant it as a, as a compliment that he was so clever he's got three PhDs. Whereas I was thinking, well, no, that's completely wrong. That's like saying Donald Trump is good at marriage because he's got three wives. That's not how research works. And what happens when you do research, what happened in my own career, is you do a PhD and you just get narrower and narrower and narrower. Uh, the focus of what you're looking at is smaller and smaller. Um, so I spent, you know, 10, 20 years thinking about a particular subject, studying it, trying to sort of understand it in all this detail. And after a long time of arguing with people and you go to conferences, you have these debates about this one topic and the topic gets smaller and smaller and smaller until you end up sort of at uh, the pinnacle of your career. You've finally dominated this area. You've understood this phenomena. You've gotten rid of all your opponents who disagreed with you. And then you look around the room and there's only like two other people in the room. And those are your students. Uh, and that's sort of the curse of academia is because what we're trying to do is push back knowledge. We specialize and specialize until we're almost the only people doing that topic. That's just part of the process of science, of course. That's not a bad thing whatsoever. But on a personal level, uh, there comes a point where that becomes uninteresting, right? You've sort of understood that phenomena and where do you go next? So it was around that time in my personal career where I, I started to look outwards again to try and sort of leave the lab a little bit and think about how these, these ideas, these methods that I've accumulated uh, could be applied outside of my laboratory, outside the theoretical questions that I had spent 20 years caring about. And that's when I joined forces with Joe Devlin, who, as you hear, had already sort of started in this trajectory. And I joined him and we worked uh, together in a, a place called Applied Cognitive Neuroscience Labs, which is a group with me, Joe, and uh, John. And it's sort of a consultancy group where we do lots of different things. We go and we give these workshops in consumer neuroscience. Uh, we address the huge misunderstandings about neuroscience that people have, like you only use 10% of your brain. So part of it is educational. Uh, part of it is sort of using neuroscience math methods to uh, as marketing. So people want to make a statement about the brain where we can put people in our image. This is a little video that uh, Joe did working with M Ford, who's a YouTube makeover person who has millions of followers. Uh, so she's using neuroscience to get sort of insight into her work. Uh, we can also use neuroscience to try and justify and understand the claims people have. And I'll talk to you about some of this research we've done today uh, with Audible and with theatre groups. Um, people have intuitions about what their product does or what their, their company achieves, and we can use our scientific methods to answer those questions. And this is the intriguing thing that we get these people coming up to us with crazy ideas. There's someone who was a professional cuddler who goes around and cuddles people for money as a stress release thing. And she wanted to so say, what's the neuroscience of that? Um, we've had whiskey companies wanting to measure the neuroscience of whiskey experience. Uh, people just come to our door with a question and our job is to try and turn that into a good scientific question, a well-formulated hypothesis that we can test. 
And what I'm going to do today is tell you about a couple of those cases. Uh, but of course, straight up you have a problem, right? And using neuroscience to understand things like collective experience, that's very difficult because lab equipment doesn't travel. That's Joe's scanner in the basement of the uh, department, several million pounds, and you can't just bring that into a pub, you can't bring that into somewhere uh, to measure things. So how is it that you can use the tools that we have outside of the laboratory? Uh, well, the solution is pretty straightforward. You use solid behavioral methods like old school experimental design. And if you understand that well, that can be ported really, really easily. And also you use a little bit of new technology, right? I mean, I have a mobile phone here that is um, effectively a supercomputer compared to the computers I used when I was in grad school in terms of the computational power, the sensors that it has. This is an insane device. If we can use that sort of technology, uh, we can study and understand people in situ in the real world. That's the hope anyway. So I'm going to talk you through two or so case studies, and then at the end I'm going to show how some of what we've learned uh, in the real world, studying collective experience, we're now using to address the COVID situation. Uh, so the first um, uh, case study I want to tell you about briefly, again, these are people coming to our consultancy uh, group and just saying, can you answer this question for us? Uh, so this is Desperados. This is a mixture of beer and tequila, which is about as nasty as it sounds. And the people who market Desperados, they have this thing, it's called um, experiential marketing. And what that means is once a year, they do something crazy. So one year they hired the jet plane that takes astronauts up and then drops suddenly so they're weightless for three minutes. Uh, they hired that, that plane out in America uh, and they filled it with um, DJs and party goers and they set it up so that when uh, the gravity went away, the beat dropped in this music. So everyone sort of started floating the moment the bass came in. So they create this experience and they call it the Desperados lifestyle. And their intuition, the thing they came to us with, they said, well, we think that uh, when you have, when you live the Desperado's lifestyle, when you have these outer world experiences, it actually has an effect on you psychologically. It increases your creativity. It broadens your horizons. It changes how you think. Now, that was their intuition. They wanted some factual evidence for that. So they hired us, and I had the strangest weekend of my life in Venice. Um, I was surrounded by a hundred of Europe's top social media influencers. That's those guys on the right. And we went to a place just outside of Venice where there is the world's deepest swimming pool. It's about 40 meters deep or so on. They hired apparently an incredibly famous DJ who I'd never heard of called Beggy Peggy Goo, and uh, she DJed this entire set and people went into the pool with these specially constructed divers helmets, you see them there, such that all the music was pumped through and there was laser lights going through, there was mermaids swimming around and they created the world's deepest nightclub. That was their goal. And they brought me in to try and test, well, does this change your, uh, uh, your creativity? Can we find evidence for that? And of course, what we did first was go back to the library, do a research, find out, well, how do you measure creativity scientifically? And if you do that, psychologists have been doing this for about um, 50 years or so, there are all these standard measures. Uh, and this is what we used in the nightclub itself. We implemented all these little tasks on iPads so we could take them uh, right into the club. We had people in full sort of body glitter uh, doing these little studies on the iPads. And you measure creativity by various things. Uh, there's one called the alternate uses task. So you take an object and you say, how many uses can you think of it? And here we use an empty bowl of desperados because it doesn't matter what the object is. Typically it's a brick or a paperclip. And you come up with lots of things. Obviously you can drink from it or you can blow of it to make a whistle. You can smash someone on the head. Uh, and all you do as a measure of creativity is just count how many of these ideas people come up with. There's also what we call the remote associate tasks. And this is where you have to think of, um, it's more like a sort of a word puzzle. So what word goes with all three of these? Cream, skate, cube. Uh, I will give you the answer, it's ice, right? So it's a little uh, linguistic Sudoku sort of thing. Uh, lastly, there's a drawing task uh, from the work of Torrance. So you just ask people to take a pen and complete this figure. So you give them a random squiggle and can they turn it into a monster and so on. And there are standardized ways to measure all these things. Now, what we did, this gives us a number on how creative our people were feeling. Uh, but of course, we need experimental methods, right? We have to compare this to something. Well, we just use the standard logic of experimental design that you uh, will or have learned about. Uh, we just use random assignment. So we took the same group of weird social media influencers and we randomized them to two groups. One group, which is the ones in yellow, took this task immediately after they came out of the pool, after they photographed themselves and had selfies. Obviously, that's more important. But after that, uh, they took our task. 
the other group that was randomly assigned. It's the same group of people, but they did it before they went into the pool. So as much as we can gather, the only difference between these two populations is that experience they had of being underwater. And what we found, honestly, to my enormous surprise, right? Most of the times I do experiments in tiny cubicles, people on mid-90s PCs, carefully pressing buttons for hours. This was body glitter, thumping bass in the middle of a club, underwater, everyone was dripping wet. But despite those not looking like experimental conditions, we had the experimental logic, right? We had our comparison between groups. So these differences that we found, I'm confident that's measuring that actual experience. And what we found on the alternative uses tasks on the left and the, uh, the drawing task on the right is we found more creativity with people after they'd had this experience. We didn't find a difference between groups on the remote associate tasks, and that's actually what we hypothesized. Uh, so the two tasks on the sides there, they measure what's called divergent learning. Uh, that's people uh, thinking creatively and crazily, sort of grabbing ideas from all different places. The task in the middle, the remote associates, that's convergent thinking. That's problem solving within a confound. And to have true creativity, you need both of these things. You need crazy ideas, but you also have to make them work within the confines of the task. Uh, so this is what we're expecting, that we'd find evidence for this divergent thinking on the experience, but not the convergent. So again, this was a bizarre experience, bizarre population, incredible situation. We found interesting results that mirrored the literature. And we're writing this right up, uh, we're writing it up now to do um, uh, for publication. And the Desperados people were very happy. They had little, uh, you know, they had me being interviewed and they had, they said what they said about the whole experience. And they had the professor from UCL explaining that this is a real benefit and that went into their marketing uh, materials and so on. So that's my first little case study of how you can use the sort of tools that we've honed in the laboratory and take them in a completely different context and still find out interesting things. And the only bit of cleverness is just the technology to use an iPad, as opposed to having you know, a bank of computers, which is why I would have needed 10, 15 years ago. The second case study that I want to talk about is another type of collective experience, uh, and that's the one of live theatre. So uh, again, we were approached, Joe and John and I, by a company who sell tickets in the West End. And they wanted to know, uh, why is it that people go out? Why, why would you go out to theatre in London? Um, it's incredibly expensive, over £100 a ticket. Uh, you've got to sit in a tiny Victorian chair. You've got to travel in on the tube. Uh, in London theatres, the roof keeps falling in all the time. Uh, so why would you do that when you could stay at home? You've probably got a 4K TV and streaming services. Why would you ever leave your own home? What is the value of that live performance experienced surrounded by other people? That's what we try to measure. So what we did was use some of our technology. Uh, and in this particular case, uh, we could have sort of surveyed people, right? We could have tapped them on the shoulder during the show. Uh, we measured uh, Dream Girls, which is on at the uh, Savoy. And we could have interrupted them and asked them about their experience, but that would have ruined the experience itself, right? You can't really do that. So instead, we turn to a bit of technology again. Uh, we use physio physiological sensors. Now, these are little wrist-based things about the size of an Apple Watch. There's lots of different ways to do this, uh, but they measure heart rate, they measure body temperature, and they measure skin conductancy. And we have found in other work that these things are really telling us about something importantly psychological. So this is the project with Audible that I referred to right at the start. And this is a separate project. I'm going to come back to theater in a second. But in this study, Audible wanted to know, well, what happens to your brain when you listen to audiobooks? And again, that's not a very scientific question, but we thought, well, actually, there is some interesting hypotheses there. How does it compare to watching video, for example, when you don't have the visual input, you're just imagining the world uh, from the text? So with Audible, we did a large scale experiment on 120 people. And they either listened to an audio passage, for example, from uh, Game of Thrones here, or they saw a carefully matched uh, video adaptation of pretty much exactly the same scene. It can never be exactly the same because you know, the adaptations add in characters and move them. Uh, but people experience the same bit of story as text being read to them or visualized here by HBO. And on the left, you can see the heart rate, which is the, uh, the height of that line. You can see the body temperature, the color, and you can see the electrodermal activity in the size of that blob. And the line that's hovering above that is redder and wider, that's them listening to the audiobooks. Uh, now, we asked people, uh, which do you find more engaging uh, when you saw that video adaptation, when you listened to the audiobook, uh, which was a more uh, transportative um, experience? And they also, they preferred the video. They felt more like they're in Westeros when they're watching the HBO adaptation uh, than listening to it. So they said they were more engaged by the video. 
But when we tracked that physiology, uh, we saw a higher heart rate, we saw more variance in the heart rate, we saw warmer body temperature, and we saw a higher electrodermal activity. All of these things suggesting they're neurophysiologically more engaged, listen to the audiobook. So why do we have this weird result that they say they're more engaged by here, but our evidence is that they're physiologically more engaged by uh, the text? What we think the difference is, is that when you watch the uh, Game of Thrones there, HBO has put an enormous amount of money and effort into visualizing that for you. They've hired all of these actors, they have incredible costumes, they have beautiful sets in Croatia, they've created that world. When you're listening on the audiobook, you've got to do all that imagination. You've got to generate that imagery. You've got to do that thinking about people and what their responses would be. And that active imagination, we can read off at your wrist. That higher mental world that you create in response to the fiction affects your body, and we can sense that all the way down here. So uh, there's more sort of uh, to that particular topic, but I'm just using it here to show you that we think of these things like Fitbits as just measuring, measuring um, health and heart rate, but really they can give us insight into psychological phenomena too. At least here, we can measure imagination. So those are the same devices that we took to the Savoy Theatre measuring uh, dream girls. So the first thing we did was put them on. So this is during, this is about 20 people here, these squiggly lines, and we showed them the performance. And the sort of the most simple analysis you could do is just think about, well, when was the heart elevated? If you go to the British Heart Foundation or other places, they say that mild exercise is when you're in sort of the top 80% of your natural heart rate. And you have those standard algorithms to calculate this. So when people were in that elevated, uh, elevated zone, that healthy heart rate zone, it's called, uh, we've colored them in red here. And what this shows you, if you add that up over time, is when you go and see Dream Girls the Musical, that's about an hour and a half, you spend about half an hour in that mild exercise zone. So going to see the theatre is a bit like half an hour of mild exercise. This wasn't a particularly interesting conclusion to us, um, but we put it out there. And then this got um, worldwide press attention that we just did not understand whatsoever. Almost every newspaper had this result. To us, this is completely uninteresting. Right? It would have been more interesting if we didn't find this sort of variation. Uh, but we got headlines uh, saying, you know, going to the theater is just like going to the gym, which is not what we said, but it gets spun and so on. So this result, scientifically not interesting, but um, captured people's imaginations um, a little bit. We were more interested in the experimental comparison. Right, that first slide I showed you, we got nothing to compare that to. Scientifically, that's not interesting. For us, it only got interesting when we started to compare the live theater to other things. So this is averaging over all those lines. This is the peaks and troughs during that performance of Dream Girls the Musical. And what we can do, this is normalized heart rate here. Uh, what we can do is compare that to people watching the movie. So Dream Girls is great because there was a movie version of it. Now those two performances, uh, the movie and the theater are uh, different times, but if you sort of scrunch them together into a performance time, uh, what you find if you look at the average heart rates is the peaks and troughs line up, kind of. Now, why is there a bump just around halfway through? Why is there another bump about three quarters of the way through? What is lining up those signals? Well, that's Dream Girls, the story. That bump right in the middle is where she first leaves the band. It's all about a Motown band in the 60s, if you don't know Dream Girls. Uh, the other bump slightly uh, further on, I think that's where she divorces her husband. And then there's a swing up at the end where everyone gets back together again. So again, this is narrative. This is a story affecting physiology in the same way across the theater and the movie. So those bumps lining up is really interesting because that's narrative affecting physiology. But also what we observed here is that if you look, the peaks in the live theater are higher and the troughs are deeper as well. There's more variance in the heart rate. And if you think about heart rate, often we think of heart rate going up as being excitement, and that certainly seems to be driving it sometimes. But also when you're really entranced in something, when you're focusing something uh, that's external, your heart rate tends to drop. So if you're doing a really hard uh, mass test and you have sort of high cognitive load, your heart rate will go down. So that's why we are interested in these bigger peaks in the, in the theater and these bigger drops. They're, you know, literally the heart stopping moments. Uh, and that's what we get particularly in this live theater. So what we're trying to do in other works is compare this to other things, right? Uh, the scientific question is, are those peaks and troughs because it's a live performance with real people on stage? Or is it because you're surrounded by a hundred people and just having that social context? So we're starting to tease these things apart by looking at the movie, showing it to small groups, showing it to a large numbers of groups, and trying to pick apart, well, is it the liveness of it, or is it the social context of it? How much does the social context matter? And so on. 
And we've done this elsewhere as well. This is a measurement of heart rate, temperature, and electrodermal activity of people watching Aladdin uh, the movie. So this sort of coordination of heart rate is not just when you have live people in front of you. Whenever there's large people in a social context experiencing something, you get this sort of a coordination in their physiological response. And you get these peaks and troughs. So you can see two thirds of the way through, there's a big uh, peak in the heart rate here. That's where Aladdin gets his first kiss. Isn't that lovely? And all the audience's hearts flutter. And again, this, uh, I hope this doesn't come across as sort of boastful that we got this press, but I'm trying to sort of show you what happens when an academic dips their toe into the real world. Uh, I'm showing you this because Joe Devlin will never show you it. There was a newspaper headline that came out last year. Uh, the royal family uh, collapsing was the front page news, of course. But what's the second story after the monarchy uh, dissolving? It's Joe Devlin's work on heart rates beating in unison while going to see Aladdin. And we thought this was not an interesting result at all, but for some reason this captured people's attentions and yeah, we were plastered over the news. Anyway, uh, what we're now looking at uh, scientifically is taking this a little deeper. Uh, just looking at the peaks and troughs doesn't tell us very much, uh, but what we're now finding is it's not just that overall people get excited at the same time. Uh, if you use a particular analysis tool that uh, cross-recurrence analysis is the one we use, and you look at literally the heartbeats and whether or not they're synchronized with each other, you can plot the degree to which people's heart rates are coordinated, are synchronizing with each other. And what you find is in live theater and in live performances, uh, the heartbeats tend to synchronize. So compared to watching in a movie, you've got more heart rate synchronization when people engage in this live performance. Now, what does this physiological synchrony tell us? Uh, we think is really, really interesting. Um, if just to take a step back, uh, you probably know that behavioral coordination is a very sort of broad phenomenon. Right, so you see in nature these flamingos here coordinating their behavior. Uh, you get it in social interaction, right? That's Donald Trump's uh, press secretary for 11 days, copying his gestures exactly. If you mimic someone's body language that you meet at the pub, that means you're flirting with them and they like you. So in the bottom corner there, that's um, two undergraduates who are in my uh, motion tracking lab at UCL. And I was just testing to see if I could track two people at once. And I just told them to stand there for 10 minutes. But of course, these are 18 year olds, so they started to flirt. So I have captured their real world flirting, see how they're copying each other's the sway, they're copying the timing of it, they're copying the hand gestures, that's flirting that is. So we know that behavioral coordination, copying people is a hallmark of social interaction, and moreover, uh, successful social interaction and um, affiliation. We've shown this in large groups and some of our other work uh, with Juno von Zimmermann. Uh, what has been discovered more recently, like the 10, 15 years ago, uh, or so, is that also physiological coordination seems to matter as well. Uh, so couples, if you stare into the eyes of the person that you love, you don't say anything, you just look at them, uh, your breathing and your heart rates will start to coordinate. Um, this is some work uh, done with familial structures. It was done by um, Ivana Konlikova, and she went to a, a village in Spain where they have one of these uh, fire walking rituals. People walk across the coals uh, when they're sort of teenage boys. And what she did was put a, a heart rate tracker on the person walking on the coals, but also on the audience members. And what she found is there was really strong heart rate coordination for the walker and his mum watching him. Slightly less heart rate coordination between the walker and his brother, slightly again for the walker and his cousin. So by putting heart rate trackers on these people, looking at that coordination, she could basically map out the familial structure of this village just by the degree to which they coordinated their physiology. We know also this sort of coordinated physiology uh, matters for team sports as well. Uh, if two rowers exercise in time with each other and coordinate their heart rates, uh, that changes their pain threshold, the amount that they'll push each other. Um, we think things like the hacker, of course, are reflecting the, the value of coordination in all sorts of, all sorts of team activities. So our question was, well, knowing all this research, does this give us any insight into what's happening with an audience, particularly with um, a live audience? And what we found is, yeah, these two things do seem to be uh, connected. So we looked at the heart rate synchrony of people uh, watching Aladdin surrounded by other people. Um, we also compared it to reading a book with other people um, sat in the same room, where you don't have that shared experience of watching the same uh, thing on screen. And what we found was that heart rate synchrony was higher when people were watching Aladdin and also the social connection they felt with each other. After the show, or after reading the book, we said, how close do you feel to the people around you? And people felt more close to each other, even though they were strangers, after watching Aladdin. 
But more interestingly than the difference between conditions was the correlation. So across all of these groups, the degree of uh, social connection people felt was significantly correlated with the heart rate synchrony between them. So we think this sort of physiological synchrony really is tapping into something about that uh, collective experience. Uh, this is work that we did, uh, that Nicole Engler did, a uh, grad student at UCL, literally days before they locked down. This is possibly the last performance the English National Opera did of um, which opera? Carmen, I think. And she took our, our sensors to people, she tracked them during this performance, and then she gave them a survey at the end to say, well, how captivated one, uh, was it? How emotional were you? How socially connected do you find? And again, we put numbers on the, um, the correlation between those measures of the engagement in the show and the heart rate coordination. And we found these really strong coordinations like uh, R is 0.84. That's a really high link between how you answer a survey and how much your heart is beating in time with other people. So we think, this is our hypothesis, that this sort of physiological coordination is very, is, is, we don't know what the causality is. It either reflects or plays a key role in this value that people have in, uh, in live performance. Part of the reason you go to the theatre is to be around those performers, to be around that audience that is coordinating your physiology and that seems to relate to the value, the emotional, the social value uh, that you then experience. And then lockdown happened. <laughs> this is where we move to how do we apply this to the current situation. Uh, lockdown happened and overnight there were no collective social experience. That was literally banned. Uh, there were no live performances. All of this got shut down overnight, which of course was terribly sad for thousands of reasons, right? It's, it's really threatening the, um, the cultural art scene that we have in this country that was one of the best in the world. Now it's under existential threat. It is, I don't want to minimize the, the problems that we face. So uh, we were thinking, um, my group and I, well, how can we use what we know and somehow address uh, this particular problem? What, what do you do about live audiences in the time of COVID? And it's a really important question because we know that there's an enormous, I'm just going to go back a slide a second. Uh, we know that there's an enormous um, psychological benefit of experiencing collective cultural things, like going to the theater, um, like um, seeing a music performance together. And this is work done by Daisy Fancourt at UCL. She's led a massive, massive survey, uh, about 5,000 households in the US, uh, sorry, in the UK, looking at uh, how many cultural experiences do you have a month and measuring things like an elderly population, uh, what is your depression, what is your frailty, and so on. And what she's found is if you have one or more cultural experience uh, a month, this is obviously before lockdown, uh, then your chance of depression goes down by a third. Uh, your chance of frailty drops massively. There are really, really strong, measurable psychological and physical advantages to going to the theater and having these collective cultural experiences. In fact, the evidence is so strong that things like joining a choir and singing with people has a strong effect as CBT or other types of clinical interventions when you look at loneliness or depression. In fact, they're so strong that uh, there are some sincere discussion at a government level that maybe the, uh, the health, the NHS, should start to be able to prescribe choral singing or be able to prescribe going to the theatre because the evidence for that being beneficial to you was as strong as many pharmacological interventions that we had. Then lockdown happened, of course, feelings of social, social isolation, feelings of depression went up. What's the one thing we could do to help ourselves not feel socially isolated? It's go to the theater. That's the other thing we absolutely can't do. So it's a potentially tragic time, not just for the performers and the people whose uh, lifelines are, you know, the business of producing theater and so on, uh, but for the audiences because we know now that they're really getting emotional, psychological value from those things that they can't have. Was there anything we could do to think about this and address the situation? That's where this came in. So this is just a project we just finished a few weeks ago. Uh, this is with Meg Obata, who's an MSc student in computer science, and Yong Yong Cho, who's, uh, again, a computer scientist um, uh, at UCL. And we were thinking about, well, how can we leverage horrible words, sorry, how can we leverage some of this information that our research has uh, discovered and other people too, and how can we think about that in the time of COVID? Well, we thought uh, the evidence suggests that if I go and see a live performance, um, then I'm going to be physiologically synchronized with the people around me. Um, that physiological synchrony is part of why I have that experience. So we thought, well, maybe we can capture that. 
right? The work I presented to you so far uses a, a wrist device. Uh, we can't put that on people because no one can touch anyone right now. But there's a technological solution which Yong Yun helped us develop. You can just use your mobile phone and you can put your finger over the camera. And the camera there, uh, particularly if you turn the light on, is sensitive enough to see the changes in blood flow beneath your skin. So you can use your um, mobile phone to track people's heart rates. Uh, Yong Yun knew someone who has a company who does that, so we worked with this company. Um, what we've done is have people watch a live performance. This is Katie, who's a... Um, a folk musician, and she's performing there, and we have about 60 people watching her live in that moment. Those 60 people have all got their finger over the camera on their mobile phone. Uh, all that data is being live streamed to a server, and Meg has written code, let me just start this video again, and Meg has written code to take that live information about the audience's heart rate and visualize it on screen. So that little yellow ring that's moving there, that is telling you uh, the audience's heart rate at that moment and how synchronized they are with each other while watching this thing. So what we try to do here is, in a sort of ham-fisted way, is graphically visualize that heart rate synchronization. We know that heart rate synchronization would happen in real life, but here we've used technology to measure it. And if you're really in the audience, you'll probably get a sense of that, right? You'd see that people are excited. You'd hear them breathing. You'd see them clapping. Uh, you'd, you'd be able to read this off just from the people around you. Here we've used technology to try and give you that energy of the crowd to depict it there. Well, our question is, does that change your experience here? So again, we used old school behavioral methods to try and get some evidence for this. Uh, we had 60... Uh, actually possibly 90 people uh, watched this performance with that visualization. But we had one group just watch the performance. We had another group uh, have that visualization, but they weren't told it was the heart rate. And then we had another group saw that visualization, were told this is the heart rate of the audience right now. So that gives us some evidence to say that, yeah, knowing the heart rate, the heart rate coordination of the audience does change my experience. And it's not just because there's a pretty blob there, it's because I know that is other people's heart rates. So looking at those uh, experimental conditions, on the right there, you see the evidence for Katie, that's the folk musician, uh, that if they had that visualization, they knew what it was, they were significantly uh, more engaged in the performance. Uh, they rated the performance on lots of dimensions, averaging over them. It was a more powerful performance, more engaging if you could visualize, uh, if you could see that visualization of the audience's heart rate. So here we have some beginnings of experimental evidence that to a little degree, we can use technology to measure that energy of the crowd. We can feed that back to people, and experimentally, it seems to have an effect. On the left there is Ellen, and Ellen did the same thing on another night, uh, but she was a poet and read her stuff. There, we did not find an effect. Uh, so it's quite an interesting case, and our hypothesis that we're going to explore with more data is that this is something to do with the medium. So Ellen was reading poetry, and there people, I think, found it very distracting to have this visualization. Uh, you had to focus on the words, and you couldn't really focus on this at the same time. Whereas if you're listening to the music performance, you can more easily listen to what was going on and look at the visualization at the same time. They didn't conflict. So we're finding evidence that this sort of heart rate visualization has an effect, but there are limiting conditions. It only works sometimes when we're trying to understand those, uh, those conditions. So that's our ongoing work, trying to take all of this information and apply it somehow to the real world. That's sort of all I wanted to uh, talk to you about today. There's, there's one other issue that I just wanted to sort of leave floating, uh, but this issue occurs to you the moment you start using physiology to understand mental states. And that's the notion of insights and privacy. Uh, so if I want to survey you and find out what you want about something, you know, I have to get your permission to survey. You have to agree to fill in these things. Uh, if you have like a listening device like Amazon, you have to sign up and agree to all that sort of stuff. So we, we understand what it means to give permission for people to survey us. We know what it means to sort of share information. Uh, but what's happening now with this sensor technology is that people can measure mental states. They can get some indication of what you are thinking, not necessarily with your permission. So I'm not going to go into this research. You can ask me about it if you, if you want. Uh, but we can track people's mouse movements while answering questions. Uh, we can look at their eye movements while they're making a decision. And using this technology that can all be done just with a webcam now, I can get insight into how certain you are about that particular choice. I can look at your deliberation while making that choice just by using these sensors. 
Uh, so when I measure the heart rate of subjects in all these experiments, we have to put a big sensor on them. Uh, but now MIT has an algorithm that can take a regular webcam, can look at changes in the blood flow and can detect just from my skin, my heart rate. So people don't need to agree to put their thumb on anything. If you just turned on these things, you can measure their heart rate. So right now, you know, you've all got webcams, they're probably turned off right now. Uh, but if Zoom imported a little algorithm, I could have a readout right now of what your heart rate is and I could use that to decide, are you listening to what I'm saying or are you bored and actually doing Facebook? Now I could have that just if I had access to Zoom's algorithm, but I wouldn't necessarily have your permission. So the moment you can start to scientifically demonstrate there's a link between physiology and mental states, we need to think through what are the ethical implications of this information because it can be harvested without consent and without knowledge. But anyway, that's a long journey from me being a graduate student all the way to uh, these sorts of experiences. I've more than used up my time. Uh, so I'm going to leave it there. That's all I wanted to say that uh, I think there's value in doing pure science, of course, and building up all these things, but there is value uh, to leaving the lab occasionally and taking all of that knowledge and applying it to the world around you and just taking these questions that are thrown up uh, by experience and by other people's experience. So talking to people in theater, talking to people who make products, uh, they have psychological questions. And I think I find it very interesting to take our psychological knowledge and try and answer those things. You can read more about this on the links there, but I'm going to stop sharing my screen right now and see if anyone has any questions.